There are human beings here in this hallowed ground. Their earthly bodies long since turned to dust. But what about their souls, their minds? Are they here too? You are about to see one of the most extraordinary films of our time. A movie that dares to investigate the possibility of life after death. Everything you will see is based on the scientific studies of parapsychologists and doctors, as well as on the testimony of real people who were pronounced dead, yet miraculously recovered, and lived to tell of their incredible journey. you from the office. Bye. What does it feel like to die? Just what happens at the moment of death? On May 10th, 1975, lawyer Dan Wilson is about to find out. taken for the last six years. The trip generally takes half an hour, but today it will last less than ten minutes. The ambulance is too late. First, everything went black and silent. Suddenly, I felt as if somehow I, I had pushed out of my own body and started to float upward above them. I could see the nurse trying to revive me. And I knew I was dead. Then, then there was a blinding light. It began to envelop me. someplace between life and death. It was beautiful. So peaceful, I didn't want to come back. There was a little bridge beyond the mist. And I somehow knew if I crossed that bridge, there was no coming back. Then I thought of you and the kids. How much you needed me. And the next thing I knew, I, I was in an ambulance. Julie. I'm not afraid of death anymore. I know what to expect now. Dan Wilson's story is typical of the hundreds of people who clinically die each year, yet survive to tell their startling accounts of the beyond. Now that the subject of life after death is being written about in the newspapers and magazines, more and more people are coming forward to tell of their own experiences in the valley of death. This picture will explore some of these actual case histories. 
You will hear them in the people's own words. We will also probe some of the ancient mysteries, like spiritualism and reincarnation. We will try to discover exactly what awaits us in the world beyond. Is death only a, a door into another time, another dimension? Well, one of history's great minds thought so. Plato taught that the soul was immortal. Men have said that death is the very end. But argue as you will, I say that the soul cannot be destroyed. After death, it withdraws to another world. What that world is like, no one knows. In 1756, Benjamin Franklin wrote, Life is rather an embryo state, a preparation for living. For a man is not completely born until he's dead. Great minds have always pondered the question of death. But over the centuries, men have had the opportunity to do more than speculate. For hundreds of years, stories have been told and retold of those who, on the very threshold of death, actually got glimpses into the world beyond. Great curiosity and speculation has always been aroused by a person's dying words. One noted example took place in 1654, as Prince Henry lay dying, attended by his wife, the royal physician, and officials. Young light, as bright as the sun. My lord, have him be. He must not disturb his eminent journey. Such glorious bells. My ears rejoice with thy music. But wait. Do I perceive royal vestments? Why, it is my father. He beckons me. He beckons me. Did Prince Henry really see into another world? Or was he just hallucinating? Stories of dying people who have looked into eternity have been printed and written about for many years. Listen to the dying words of these famous people. In 1861, world famous poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning spoke these words from her deathbed. Could her observations be true or merely hopeful speculation? It, it, it is beautiful. The famed aviation pioneer, Eddie Rickenbacker, after a near-fatal plane crash. Dying is the sweetest, tenderest, most sensual sensation I've ever experienced. In 1931, these were the last words of Thomas Edison. It's very, very beautiful. All of these people died shortly after having these visions, and so can tell us little. But in today's highly advanced world of medical technology, we have sophisticated equipment to sustain life. And we can often snatch patients back from the very jaws of death, returning them to life. The stories these people have to tell about life beyond death are causing science to look for some new answers. A recent Gallup poll showed that 73% of the people questioned said they believed in an existence after death. But just what did the scientists say about that? Here you are, Doctor. Thank you. One of the most renowned, if indeed not the leading expert in the new field of thanatology or death experience, is psychiatrist Dr. Eleanor Stevens. Dr. Stevens has spent years researching the psychological and emotional state of terminally ill patients. Dr. Stevens was drawn to her studies and work with the terminally ill when she realized how little medical science really knew about the inevitable act of dying. But what is it like to die? Is everything going to go black? Will there be pain? How does one prepare to die? What can the doctors do to help? Just how do you prepare someone for the grim reality of death? Dr. Stevens' research opened the door to the serious study of this long neglected and forbidden subject. Now that we've discussed how you feel about your physical condition, Anne, is there anything else you'd like to talk to me about? For example, you know, how you feel mentally, psychologically right now? How are your spirit? The best way, the only way to study death is to observe it firsthand. To do this, Dr. Stevens asked the patients themselves to be teachers and with their permission set up a discreet method whereby doctors, nurses, and social workers could be unseen witnesses, observing the scene through a two-way mirror from an adjoining room. What now do you think? Are you 
most afraid of. Interviews with patients who were near death revealed astounding stories describing their experiences, stories which made Dr. Stevens question many popular medical beliefs. One such patient was a housewife named Ann Fleck, who had been suffering from Hodgkin's disease and had been near death many times. The startling story she was about to relate would have a dramatic effect on Dr. Stevens and the entire medical profession. Doctor, I have to tell you something. I've got to tell somebody. But something happened to me that I, I can't explain. It happened about a year ago. We'd invited the Mattingleys over for dinner after they'd come back from their vacation in Las Vegas. And Edna and I, we were in the kitchen. And Hank and George, oh, what a they were in the living room. Trip. Sunshine every single day. Beautiful shows every night. I, I think Hank liked them a little better than I might like them. <laughs> <laughs> they were fun. George, you should see some of those shows in Vegas. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. You know, one of their shows claims that their costumes cost over half a million dollars. Can you imagine that? Uh, huh? Anne. What's going on in there? Anne? 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 Is she hurt? She just collapsed. Listen, go call an ambulance and Dr. Morris. The numbers are right next to the phone, okay? Yes. Let's take her upstairs. Okay. I seemed to fall into a darkness, and I started to hear voices. I recognized one of them as Dr. Myers, but, but then something strange happened. She's been gone for 15 minutes, Doctor. Keep trying. But she's dead, Doctor. I could see myself below. Down there on the bed, my face was pale and lifeless. I could feel myself being drawn through some kind of shell or tunnel towards a brilliant light at the other end. It felt good and warm, and I wasn't scared anymore. Then I was back floating above the bed. After the attendant said that I was dead, I I saw you pull on your chin. And George, he made the sign of the cross. Anne Fleck died a short time later. But because of her cooperation and that of many courageous people like her, Dr. Stevens was able to seriously investigate for the first time the possibility of life after death. The doctor soon concentrated all her work on dying patients. She was startled to discover that those patients who had survived death all had similar stories to tell. She reviewed tape recordings of other interviews, cross-checked them against each other. The stories of death experiences were remarkably similar in detail. Then, one day, while lecturing about the death experience to a college audience... Then reaching a bright source of light at the other end. Yes. You've been telling us about all these spooky cases you've seen, about people surviving death and telling you about an afterlife. But do you really believe in all that jazz? It's not a matter of belief or opinion. I know, beyond the shadow of a doubt, there is life after death. Dr. Stevens had not intended to make her beliefs public as yet, because there was so much work ahead, but now it was out. In the next few months, the news media blew up Dr. Stevens' startling statement into bold headlines. Cranks began to call. Okay, now let's not be hasty. Offering to commit suicide in the name of research. Despite Dr. Stevens' contribution to our understanding of dying and death, clergymen were upset because the doctor was attempting to explain scientifically what they claimed to be a matter of faith. But it wasn't simply a matter of faith to Dr. Stevens' patients. Anne Fleck knew what she had lived, or rather died through. Everyone who's been through death's door has a story to tell about what it was like on the other side. Like Byron Temple. 
Byron didn't expect to die on that day after Christmas in 1974. But that's just what he did. He died. Temple was a 40-year-old construction worker. He had never considered himself a devoutly religious man. Yet for him, his journey into the world beyond produced startling religious implications. Oh, that's it. Well, I've got to get in here. Watch it! Ah! <laughs> to take more pictures of him in the morning. I'm afraid there's no need for that. I don't think he'll last the night. What does specialist say? Then suddenly, I felt like I was slipping, slipping out of my own body. And pulled through a long tunnel. Soon I was high over a city and I could see the lights blinking beckoning me. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Words can't describe the beauty nor the splendor of such a city. The light was overwhelming. And I knew it was not from this world. Suddenly I was back in the hospital room, but hovering over the bed, looking down at my own body. Then I saw a familiar person get out of a red car and enter the hospital. It was Pastor Fieldson. I could see him come out of the elevator and stop a nurse. I'm Pastor Fieldson. I've come to see Byron Temple. I'm sorry, Pastor. You're too late. He died a few minutes ago. Then I saw that brilliant light again, moving toward me. I could feel an overwhelming warmth that I've never known before. It enveloped me. It was a divine presence. It was God. I could hear no voice, no spoken words, but I was asked what I wanted to do. I wanted to stay here. I had never felt so loved, so secure. But I was told I had more to do yet. Suddenly, I felt myself descending, floating lower, moving closer to my body. Then a wave of cold gripped me as I seemed to enter that lifeless form that was me. And my eyes flickered open for a moment. He just opened his eyes. What? But he can't be alive. The doctor pronounced him dead a half an hour ago. I don't believe it. Doctor. I can't believe it. Forgive me, Jim, but you must have been wrong when you pronounced him dead. Bill, that man was clinically dead. He had no heartbeat for over half an hour. But you know the brain can't last that long without oxygen. If he did, he'd be a vegetable by now. But he isn't. There must have been some brain damage. You heard what he said about those lights. About seeing... God. Surely you don't believe that. I don't know. I've never died and lived to tell about it. Byron Temple is still alive today. One conclusion from his story is seemingly inescapable. His experience clearly implies the existence of what is commonly called the soul. But the cold clinical attitude of science rejects a word like soul. They prefer a term like consciousness, the mysterious energy of the mind. All right, just what do we know about energy in general? 
The law of physics regarding energy states, as wood burns, it turns to ashes. Steel melts and becomes a molten liquid. In other words, energy cannot be destroyed. It can only be changed into another form, like splitting atoms for a nuclear bomb. But what happens to the invisible energy of consciousness at death? This organ, the human brain, is the most complex, most mysterious thing known to man. We know it emits energy because we can measure its wave activity, electrical impulses, alpha waves, among others. Today, scientific research centers are springing up all over the world where parapsychologists are devoting themselves to just one field, the mysterious energy released by the human brain. In the United States alone, there are now over 100 universities offering courses in parapsychology where ongoing experiments with the mind are part of the daily curriculum. It has already been proven that some people can control their mental energy and fine-tune it in such a way as to send or receive electrical brain impulses. Recently, top scientists at Stanford Research Institute performed an incredible experiment which proved electrical impulses of the brain could be transmitted from thousands of miles away. A target observer was flown to a city in South America where he stood focusing his concentration on the image of the airport there. Twenty-eight hundred miles away in California, the test subject received a mental picture and sketched what his mind saw. This is that picture he saw mentally. One of the most startling examples of the brain's energy is the phenomenon called psychokinesis. Here we see famed psychic Yuri Geller moving a compass with nothing but the force of his mind. We know consciousness exists. We know it has energy. There's proof of it. We know that energy cannot be destroyed, only altered. So what happens to consciousness, to this invisible energy of the brain at death? All religions teach us that after death, we go to heaven or hell, and the faithful accept this as fact. But what about atheists and other people who don't follow religious doctrine? Can they deny the hundreds of cases of people who have died and come back to tell their experiences beyond life? like the case of Dr. Paul Kelly, the most famous case of death survival, one that's been reported in books and countless magazines. In December 1943, Kelly had just completed his basic training and was about to be transferred to the Army's medical center, where he would study to become a doctor. Just a few days before he was to leave on the train, he came down with what he thought was a bad cold, but it was a lot worse than that. lousy piece of luck. Here I was just about ready to leave, and then they slapped me in the base hospital with a rotten chest cold. Or so I thought. You see, for a private like me to get a chance at medical school was practically unheard of. I was convinced that if I missed that train, my chances to become a doctor were over forever. I had no idea at the time how sick I was. I just wanted to make that train. I knew I had a fever. So I conned one of the orderlies out of a bottle of aspirin and kept popping him down. <coughs> I even coughed into the pillow so the doctors wouldn't hear me. On December 19th, I was taken to the recuperation wing, and a jeep was scheduled to pick me up at 4 a.m. to take me to the railroad station. At 3.30 in the morning, I got up to dress, but couldn't make it. stretcher and push down a long hall. And then I remember coming to in the x-ray room. 
Think you can stand long enough for one shot? Yeah, I think so. Hundred and six point five, still going up. How can a man with such an advanced case of pneumonia be scheduled for release this morning? The staff's overloaded. There's flu epidemic. That's still no excuse. This man is dying. Nurse? He stopped breathing. There's no pulse. This man shouldn't be dead, but he is. I want a full report on this. A complete workup. Doctors, nurses, orderlies, everybody involved. You read me? Yes, sir. Clean this place up. Get him ready for the morgue. I'm sorry, Captain. So am I. After the X-ray room, the next thing I remember was waking up in a small room and seeing a little lamp burning on an end table. All I could think of was the train. I had to make that train. I jumped out of bed and looked around for my uniform. Then I happened to look back toward the bed. Someone else was in it. The same bed I'd just gotten out of. How'd he get there? I was just in that bed a minute ago. Then in the dim light, I saw the gray skin of his arm, a lifeless hand. Whoever it was, he was dead. There was a fraternity ring on one of the fingers exactly like mine. Hallucinating. I ran to the door and looked back again, but he was still there. I mean, it couldn't be my body. Was I going crazy? I hurried out into the hall. An orderly was coming right at me. I hollered at him. Hey, look out! He seemed to go right through me. What's happening here? Then, I found myself in darkness. Where was the hospital? Where was I? I was floating through the air above a town. And then another moment later, I was on a city street. I just wanted to know if I could feel something, anything. I reached out my hand to touch the telephone pole. But my hand couldn't make contact with it. That body on the bed back at the base hospital was mine. Somehow, I... We'd become detached. I had to get back to it. Hey. I raced through the halls of the hospital, trying to find that little room. Wait. No one seemed to see me. Doctor! Finally, I found my room. And there was the body. Could it really be mine? I tried to pull off the sheet, but I couldn't grab it. I had no substance, it was true. I was dead. Is this what death is? Without warning, the room began to fill with light. There was no word to describe a brilliance that intense. But it wasn't just light, it was a feeling of warmth, of love completely overwhelming me. I wanted to lose myself in it forever. Then I 
was squeezing through a cramped, warm tunnel. Someone reached in and gently pulled me. After that, my whole life flashed before me. More than that, really, I was reliving every moment of it. Every sight, every smell, every sound. Seeing, feeling it. Then the light seemed to speak to me, but I heard no voice. It said I was in the presence of the Son of God, and he was asking me what I'd done with my time on Earth. All of a sudden, I knew everything I'd ever done was meaningless. I knew now I was dying, and I wanted more of a chance. I pleaded that I was too young to die yet. Then the voice said that no one is too young to die. After that, the light blazed so brightly I couldn't see anything anymore, until I found myself in another dimension. I really don't know how to explain it. But another world existing parallel to ours, like a photograph with a double exposure. And I found myself in a room with some futuristic lab equipment and lasers and computer banks. And this was 20 years before they were even invented. I was in another time. Suddenly, I was shot out of that unearthly room and into space. I could see a city. Not of steel and glass, but a city made of light. The buildings, the streets, everything was constructed of light. You can check for yourself, Doctor. I swear I heard him. <clears throat> He's breathing. But he was dead. You checked him. We both checked him. He's been dead for nine minutes. A few weeks later, they were ready to discharge me from the hospital. All I could think of was what I had experienced. I was confused, troubled. I couldn't wait to be alone in that room so I could have a look at the chart. And there it was, in print. It was official. Private Paul Kelly died December 20th, 1943. 05, 1600 hours, double lobar pneumonia. Patient revived, 05, 2500 hours. No sign of brain damage. I was hoping to get that chart out of here before you saw it. I don't understand this, Captain. Look, you're going to study medicine. You'll soon find out that the more you learn, the less you understand. No, no, this says I was dead for nine minutes. Now, even with my limited knowledge, I know that the brain can't survive that long without blood. Well, I say that. Well, how do you explain this? I can't. At least not in terms of natural explanations. Well, then, you must have been wrong when you pronounced me dead. Look, Private Kelly, I'd like to agree with you, but I can't. Since this war began, I've watched dozens of men die. Check them and recheck them to make sure. I know death when I see it. It isn't only the vital signs, the lack of heartbeat, pulse. You begin to recognize death, to smell it, to sense its presence. Only God knows what happened in this room. But you were dead. You were dead for nine minutes. For ten years, I didn't tell a soul what happened to me in that room. Later, I told my wife. And it was years before she could bring herself to believe it. Twenty years later, in 1963, Dr. Paul Kelly, by then a prominent Charlottesville psychiatrist, finally revealed his incredible experience of life after death. Now, it has been argued that experiences claimed by those who are clinically dead can be explained as hallucinations brought about by trauma or high fever or drugs. But in many cases, patients reported specific knowledge and astounding facts that cannot be rationalized in any way. Like the case of Jacob Thompson, a blind biologist given a unique glimpse of the world beyond life. So you're sure then? Biopsy proved the tumor malignant. It has to be removed, Jacob. How soon? Immediately. They're still after me. Who's that? Fates, destiny, whoever calls the shots. 
Let him be born healthy, they said. But he won't need a mother, so we'll grab her off before he's two years old. And then they decided I didn't need a father, so they recalled him. So let him become a biologist. Sure, why not? But not for long. Then they explode that lab and take his eyes. So I became a teacher. A blind teacher, but still a teacher. Now I've got this ball of microbes spreading inside of me. And so what's next, a wheelchair? Of course not. What kind of risk is involved? There's always a risk, you know that. Odds, doctor, I want to hear odds. 50-50? Terrific. Why me? Why me? Feeling sorry for yourself isn't going to help. I know. I know. When I lost my sight, I spent six months swimming in self-pity. And then I discovered a whole new world out there in the darkness. Simple things. Things that I'd taken for granted or hadn't even noticed before. The smell of bacon frying. The sound of children's laughter. The taste of a ripe tomato. And the warm, soft touch of my wife's face when she's sleeping. You don't need eyes to feel love. The mind doesn't need a light to touch a star. I want to live, Doctor. So, let's get on with it. Over there, a little more to the left. That's good. Swamp. Won't be long now. Bad. Vital signs are in steady, Doctor. We use shock. Hurry. We're losing him. There's no reading at all. It's no use, Doctor. He's gone. Adrenaline! Been here this morning. Hmm. That's funny. Could have sworn it was around here. It moved. What? The one we just brought in. He moved. This guy's still alive. Get a doctor. You're looking just fine today. How do you feel? Great. For a guy they say kicked the bucket three weeks ago. Who told you that? One of the night nurses told her relief all about it. They thought I was asleep. Pay no attention to them. Is it true? Look, I'm not God. Even the authorities are arguing about the correct definition of death and exactly at what moment it occurs. You didn't answer the question. Was I dead? To give you the proper technical response, you showed no vital signs for quite some time. Something happened out there in that operating room. Something that I don't understand. That makes two of us, Jacob. Open. I, I saw the whole thing. What? Look at me. I'm blind. 
totally stone blind, and I tell you, I saw everything going on. You were under pretty deep then. We're just hallucinating. You want specifics? I'll give them to you. The nurse was carrying a couple of things to put on my chest, and she dropped one of them. And then you leaned over me, and, and your glasses slipped down, and you pushed them back. And then you took a large syringe and put it right here. What else did you see? There was a, a bright light. And I... OK, we come in. Come on in, Jacob. These are two men who really saved your life. How are you doing? Fine. Uh, better than expected. Listen, that pin you lost, it was under the table in the corner of the morgue, wasn't it? Yeah, but how did you know that? I saw it there. You saw it? But I thought you were blind. Shh. Thanks for dropping in, boys. Well, hang in there, Mr. Thompson. How could that totally blind biologist see such minute detail as he described to the doctor? Get some rest now, Jacob. In no way could it be considered a hallucination. What then? ESP? Did Jacob Thompson merely read the mind of the doctor? Of the orderly who lost the pen? Are these death experiences merely common psychophenomena? To find out, Let's consider the story of Amy Parker, well. one of the most convincing and astounding cases authenticating the death experience. Then just when are you going to start teaching me how to fly? In time, in time. Sure, sure. After you monopolize the plane <laughs> for yourself. You're just like a kid with a new toy. But it's such a beautiful day to fly and just relax. You're and... the one that's always so safety conscious. Suppose something happened to us when we were up there at 6,000 feet. Oh, come on. You're reaching. And I didn't know how to get us down. I couldn't very well call for the auto club to come get us. Okay, you win. I'll give you a lesson one. <laughs> today. <laughs> mm. I love you. <laughs> It was October 12th, 1976. Eric and I had just celebrated our second wedding anniversary, and we decided to take a little cruise in the plane we just bought three weeks before. Now, this is what I call really living. Everything down there seems so. Insignificant. Except us. Buying this airplane was the second best thing I ever did. <laughs> Marrying you was the first. <laughs> now, start slowly. Lesson number one. Straight and level flight. against the instrument panel and then everything went black but after a while the darkness began to slip away and there was this magnificent pure light it was radiant it was brighter than the sun but it didn't hurt my eyes it made me feel peaceful and warm then i saw eric standing outside the plane and i wondered how he got there he was wearing different clothes, the new blue suit he just bought, and he wasn't wearing any shoes. I could hear Eric begging this man for forgiveness. I was really mad. And why should Eric do this? What had he done? And, and who was this man 
the stranger. Then all of a sudden, I knew who it was. Nobody spoke, but I could hear his name. Eric Parker did, in fact, die in the crash. But it was not until some weeks later that Amy would share her most startling revelation. See that rose bush over there? Mm -hmm. He bought it on sale for half price. <laughs> it was dying. All the leaves were brittle and dropping off. He pampered it, took it in at night and brought it back out in the morning. He babied it. He gave it a new life. <laughs> Just he gave me a new life. Memories are peculiar things, Amy. They can comfort us or they can torment us. Let yours warm you, not hurt you. It's the way Eric would want it. It's been almost a month since the crash, and you're the first one who's even mentioned Eric's name. Everybody keeps avoiding it, as if he never even existed. They're only trying to make things easier for you. I didn't even get to go to the funeral. You were in the hospital. There was a reason I asked you to come here, Reverend. You're the only one I could even hope might understand. I'll try. I didn't want to ask anyone else because I was afraid to. No, not afraid to. I was just reluctant to know the truth. The truth about what, Amy? The clothes they buried Eric in. It was his new blue suit, wasn't it? Yes, but why torture yourself about... How did you know that? Your mother-in-law said that no one's mentioned anything to you about the funeral. He wore no shoes. That's why I saw him barefoot. Of course. They don't bury dead with shoes or socks on. What are you talking about, Amy? I saw him. I saw Eric. Right after we crashed, just outside the plane, he was in his new suit. And he was with... What is it? I'm not afraid. I'll never be afraid again, especially of dying. Because I saw him. I saw him. You saw who? Jesus. Jesus. If Amy Parker experienced only visions induced by the trauma of the plane crash, how do we explain her knowing what clothes her husband was buried in? Is it possible that what she saw was an apparition of his soul? Well, there's that word again, soul. Is there any way to scientifically prove the existence of the soul? Some have tried. In this journal of the American Society for Psychical Research, there is a report on Dr. Duncan McDougall and his incredible experiment to attempt to weigh the soul. We're ready, sir. In McDougall's experiment, he constructed a special bed with a light framework. It was mounted on delicately balanced scales, which were sensitive to two tenths of an ounce. Many terminally ill patients volunteered for the experiment, and they were made as comfortable as possible. Weight loss continues at a steady rate of one ounce per hour. That's normal evaporation of the body fluids. It was unthinkable to Dr. McDougall that consciousness should exist in the brain, yet not occupy space. Solids, liquids, and gases all have weight. Therefore, it was conceivable to him that if there was a soul which departed from the body at the precise moment of death, then there should be a subsequent and noticeable loss in the patient's weight. He hasn't breathed for minutes now, but he's still alive. His facial muscles continue to move, but he's weakening faster now. The heart's slowing down considerably. It stopped. It dropped three quarters of an ounce, precisely when his heart stopped.
The same experiment was conducted on five more dying patients, and in each case, the same thing happened. The patient lost one half to three quarters of an ounce in weight at the exact moment of death. There was absolutely no medical reason to explain the abrupt weight loss at death, unless, according to Dr. McDougall, it was the soul leaving the body. The doctor then conceived another provocative proposal. The same experiment was conducted on 15 different dogs. The results were uniformly negative. None of the animals showed any loss in weight at death. Could that mean, the doctor wondered, that lower life forms have no souls? Whether or not Dr. Duncan McDougall really weighed the soul as it left the body is still being debated. But has anyone ever seen the transposition take place? Actually witnessed the soul withdrawing from the body? The Journal of the American Society for Psychical Research, plus these files of parapsychologists, record countless case histories in which witnesses claim to have seen unexplainable occurrences at the moment of death. One of the most delightful books ever written was this. Little Women. The author, Louisa May Alcott, was one of America's most famous writers. She described an incident that took place when her sister passed away. Present were Miss Alcott, her mother, and the family doctor. There were no indications that anything extraordinary might happen. But then, at exactly the moment of death, I saw something. Dear God. What was it? What was it Louisa May Alcott, her mother and doctor, saw emanate from the sister's body? Could all three of them have seen some optical illusion simultaneously? More recently, on November 2nd, 1971, Margot Louisa sat with her grandfather as he lay dying at the family home in Greenville, Mississippi, while the family waited in the hall outside. We knew Grandpa had only minutes to live. The doctor said death would come at any moment now. We decided the room shouldn't be crowded with people, so I asked to be alone with him. Grandpa was one of those old school Italians and had always been a devout Catholic. To him, death was going to heaven, seeing his mother and father, all those who had already passed on. So there was no heavy feeling of grief among the family. We knew Grandpa was ready to die, that it would be a happy death. Suddenly, he took a long, heavy sigh and went perfectly still. Tears began to well up in my eyes because I knew he was gone. I started to get up to summon the others when something like a thin vapor seemed to come through his body and float upward. I followed it with my eyes as it floated upward toward the ceiling. I'm not the bravest woman in the world, but crazy as it sounds, I wasn't the least bit frightened. In fact, I felt warm, moved because I knew I had just witnessed something profoundly spiritual. I'm not as religious as I should be, but what happened in that room that day, I've never, ever forgotten. In 1911, a French photographer named Baradou shared his wife's fervent belief that upon death, the soul left the body. Years before, she had extracted a solemn promise from him. Whoever died first, the other would attempt to photograph the exact moment of death. When the time came and it was she who was dying, Baraduk had to struggle against his grief, but he made good his promise and photographed his wife just as the last breath of life left her body. This, then, is that now famous photograph taken by Baraduk. We have seen death experiences of some fairly average people. But what about the famous, the internationally renowned? Have any of them had similar encounters with death? 
and would they dare to make it public? Just after midnight on July 8, 1918, a 19-year-old reporter believed he had been killed, according to a friend, George Hickok of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. The following is that young reporter's own account of his fleeting journey into death. Here then are the actual words of Ernest Hemingway. I felt my soul or something come out of my body like you'd pull a silk handkerchief out of a pocket by one corner. It flew around and then came back in again. And I wasn't dead anymore. Later, Ernest Hemingway recreated this personal account of death in chapter nine of his great war novel, A Farewell to Arms, on page 54. So far, we have seen that there are 14 elements common to the experiences related by all those who claim to have died and seen beyond. Some of these are a loud buzzing, an intense white light that seems to overwhelm them, finding themselves out of their bodies, floating above the scene and looking down on their own bodies, seeing their lives rush before them. And most of them report seeing something that they knew represented a borderline between this world and the next, a door, a bridge, a body of water. And somehow they knew that if they ventured beyond that point, they would never return to the land of the living. One of the most graphic examples of this occurred in the death experience of Ursula Phillips. For her, the point of no return took the appearance of a gate. Our little girl, about to have her third child, Think of it, Sam. Our baby with three of her own. Seems such a short time ago when she came in here on the day of the high school prom, crying her heart out just because she had a cold sore on her lip. <laughs> now she has her own children. Oh, where did all the years go, Sam? They're still around. In this house, the yard, tucked away somewhere, so we could take them down every now and then and shake them out, enjoy them again, like now. That was the doctor who phoned just now, wasn't it? He was just asking how you are. Reminded me not to give you anything to eat after six. It's a dangerous operation, I know it. I could tell by the way he keeps pulling her aside when we're in the office. Phoning you. Now, don't go making it such a bad <laughs> thing. I just can't help. I'm afraid of dying. Hey, now, you're being just downright silly, sweetheart. Nothing's going to happen to you. I just wouldn't allow it. You've got my word on that. I know that. You've always been right, Sam. About everything. Don't be wrong now. Ursula Phillips' operation took place as scheduled. But once she returned to her room, there were complications. Doctor's on his way. Check for pulse and heart rate. The alarm went off. She feels cold. And, and look at her face. There's no color in it. <laughs> Suddenly, I found myself over the bed, looking down at my own body. At Sam and the nurse. I could feel the pain leaving me, starting with my toes. 
and going up my body. I felt so incredibly calm, even as the doctors and nurses rushed in and tried to revive me. No, doctor. Every care I had was just slipping away. I'd never known such a peaceful feeling. And I, I sensed a presence in the room. I was drawn to it like a wonderful magnet. And there, standing near the bed, was a being so beautiful. He seemed to radiate. He didn't speak. At least I heard no audible voice. He beckoned, and I followed him to the most beautiful place. It was like heaven. Then before me appeared a gate. I wanted to pass through it. I, I didn't want to leave this wondrous place. But I heard him telling me, not now, not now. Vital signs returning. Then I felt the pain return. It started in my head and traveled down my body to my toes. And I knew I was back among the living. Is it just coincidence that in almost all death experiences, the person saw what was described as a divine entity? Remember, Byron Temple said, I knew it was... It was God. Paul Kelly. The light seemed to speak to me only. I heard no voice. It said I was in the presence of the Son of God. Amy Parker. Jesus. I saw Jesus. People of all faiths, Christians, Jews, Mohammedans, Buddhists, who were clinically dead yet survived, all reported a confrontation with God. This isn't going to be easy for me, doctor. One patient who survived death was an avowed atheist. Not only did he not believe in God, but he had no religious indoctrination whatsoever. You see, this, this light caught me. I mean, boy, it dropped over me like a, like a shimmering net. And there he was, this strange man, looking at me with such piercing eyes. Yet, they were warm eyes, kind. I wanted to go with him because I knew he was... You know I don't believe in God. But somehow, I knew he was a divine presence. Still another frequent element of the death experience seeing dead relatives and friends who have come to take away the dying one. In many cases, the patients didn't even know their relatives were dead. As in this example of a dying 12-year-old girl. She... She doesn't have much time. High fever, she's hallucinating. Who? Who wants you to go with him, dear? Don't do this to yourself. Who do you see, honey? I don't know him, but he, he's my brother. He keeps calling me. I well, didn't know you had a son. Why, he's dead. He died before she was born. We, we never even told her about him. How could she know? Do the dead appear to the dying to guide them into the next world, into life after death? Is it only people near death who are able to see and hear those who have already died and passed beyond? For centuries, spiritualists have claimed to be able to communicate with those departed. And today, professional mediums find a devoted following in people in every walk of life, from housewives to world leaders. And for every professional spiritual advisor showed to be a hoax, there are countless others who defy explanation and baffle the experts. Some, while in a trance, even speak in foreign tongues or in a voice of the opposite sex. <laughs> Shh. 
still can't bait your own hook, Daffy. And stay out of elevators at night, Daffy. We're not expecting you for some time yet. The common notion is that the medium acts as a communications link to the next world, speaking to the living friends and relatives on behalf of the departed one. The image of a group gathered around a table in a darkened room has been popularized over the years in fiction, movies, and television. This dim environment, of course, helps to aid those whose intent it is to deceive the gullible with mysterious sounds, strange voices, moving objects, and general cheap theatricality. Fortunately, the skeptics have not entirely discouraged serious scholars from studying this area. During a seance in Iceland, the spirit of a dead man allegedly spoke through a medium, and a scientific paper on the incident was written by Professor Paul Cresswell, head of the psychology department of the University of Iceland, and his colleague, Thorold Rigby, from the psychiatry department of the University of Virginia. The voice or spirit identified itself, describing how it looked in life. My face was craggy, my nose large and prominent, broken in two places. I was working under my truck, repairing my transmission, when the jack suddenly slipped and I was crushed beneath the axle. But the door to this hole, where was he? What is the beyond? Where does the soul or consciousness go when it leaves the body? To heaven, where we shall see God and be reunited with our loved ones, or, as many psychical researchers and spiritualists believe, remain right here on our own planet, but in another dimension. Does each of us go through an endless cycle of births and deaths, dying and being reborn again in different bodies? Plato believed that if the soul can exist in the future, it must also have existed in the past. Could this indestructible energy that we call consciousness, the soul, could be transferred to another body in reincarnation and live again? And if we have lived a former life, why don't we remember it? Or do we? By the case histories we've shown you, have all involved people who survived clinical or accidental death. But the accounts of those who tried to commit suicide and failed are another story, a horror story. Typical of the experiences told by people who survived after attempting to take their own lives is the case of this 22-year-old bride-to-be from Gary, Indiana. For obvious reasons, her name cannot be made public, but it happened in April of 1975. This is her story as she later told it to a psychiatrist. It began on the fateful day she went to her fiancé's house to make dinner. Eric and I were to be married in less than a week. We were in love, and I had never been happier. another woman and he'd fallen in love with her and he couldn't marry me I, I couldn't believe it I, I didn't know what to do I knew I couldn't stay in that apartment I had to get out of there I to kill myself. Suddenly, 
I was going through a long, dark subway. The pain was excruciating. I tried to scream, but couldn't. And I was so cold and terrified. And something started striking out at me. Hands kept ripping at my skin. No, they weren't hands. They were snakes. I came out of the tunnel into some horrible swamp where people, all of them dead, were moaning and crying out. The smell of death was everywhere. Oh, God, pray for me. Some unknown force choose to punish those who try to take their own lives. Because in every case of suicides who survived, they told the same kind of horror story as the girl we've just seen. While on the other hand, natural death or even accidental death seemed almost pleasant. Would you like to see what it's like to enter that region between life and death? All right. You're in a hospital room. You're dying. The doctors are working over you. <coughs> Massage isn't working. We'll have to give him shock. through a long, narrow tunnel. <laughs> then you will find yourself floating above your own body. Departed friends and relatives will appear before you. You will experience a divine presence. be the sensation of actually getting up and leaving the room. Soon, a gate or doorway will appear before you. You will know it to be the point of no return.
darkness, that warm white light will engulf you and bring you back into your body. I can't believe it. The pulse rate is almost back to normal. We've presented you with the facts, with the real stories of people who clinically died and returned to tell us of what they experienced. We know that both ancient and modern philosophers believe that the soul survives death. We've heard the testimony of medical men and parapsychologists, seen the stories of actual people who experienced a glimpse into the afterlife. Dan Wilson. Ann Fleck. Byron Temple. We have explored psychic phenomena, spiritualism, and reincarnation. Scientific investigation into these areas is finally clearing the clouded veil that has obscured them for so long. These subjects are now being lifted out of the realm of superstition and being laid into the realm of fact. The heaven and hell, or another place for us in a different time or dimension. If you're a religious person, you already believe in life beyond death. If you're a scientist, you're still trying to figure it out. But one thing is certain. Something awaits us. And one day we shall all find out. In the end. Or is it the beginning? Mm -hmm.